Hello, brothers and sisters. This is Lisa, and I'm here to share some devotionals with all of you. The title is Saying and Doing, and this is part six. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Matthew 23, verse 3. Christ declared John the Baptist to be one of the greatest of the prophets, and he showed his hearers that they had had sufficient evidence that John was a messenger from God. The words of the preacher in the wilderness were with power. He bore his message unflinchingly, rebuking the sins of priests and rulers and enjoining upon them the works of the kingdom of heaven. He pointed out to them their sinful disregard of their father's authority in refusing to do the work appointed them. He made no compromise with sin, and many were turned from their unrighteousness. Had the profession of the Jewish leaders been genuine, they would have received John's testimony and accepted Jesus as the Messiah but they did not show the fruits of repentance and righteousness. The very ones whom they despised were pressing into the kingdom of God before them. In the parable, the son who said, I go, sir, represented himself as faithful and obedient, but time proved that his profession was not real. He had no true love for his father, So the Pharisees prided themselves on their holiness, but when tested, it was found wanting. When it was for their interest to do so, they made the requirements of the law very exacting. But when obedience was required from themselves, by cunning sophistries, they reasoned away the force of God's precepts. Of them Christ declared, Do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Matthew 23, verse 3. They had no true love for God or man. God called them to be co-workers with him in blessing the world, but while in profession they accepted the call, in action they refused obedience. They trusted to self and prided themselves on their goodness, but they set the commands of God at defiance. They refused to do the work which God had appointed them, and because of their transgression, the Lord was about to divorce himself from the disobedient nation. And that's the end of part six, and now for part seven. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Isaiah 64, verse 6. Self-righteousness is not true righteousness, and those who cling to it will be left to take the consequences of holding a fatal deception. Many today claim to obey the commandments of God, but they have not the love of God in their hearts to flow forth to others. Christ calls them to unite with him in his work for the saving of the world, but they content themselves with saying, I go, sir. They do not go. They do not cooperate with those who are doing God's service. They are idlers. Like the unfaithful son, they make false promises to God. In taking upon themselves the solemn covenant of the church, they have pledged themselves to receive and obey the word of God, to give themselves to God's service, but they do not do this. In profession, they claim to be sons of God, but in life and character, They deny the relationship. They do not surrender the will to God. They are living a lie. The promise of obedience they appear to fulfill 
when this involves no sacrifice, but when self-denial and self-sacrifice are required, when they see the cross to be lifted, they draw back. Thus the conviction of duty wears away, and known transgression of God's commandments becomes habit. The ear may hear God's word, but the spiritual perceptive powers have departed. The heart is hardened, the conscience seared. Do not think that because you do not manifest decided hostility to Christ, you are doing him service. We thus deceive our own souls by withholding that which God has given us to use in his service be it time or means, or any other of his entrusted gifts, we work against him. Satan uses the listless, sleepy indolence of professed Christians to strengthen his forces and win souls to his side. Many who think that though they are doing no actual work for Christ, they are yet on his side are enabling the enemy to preoccupy ground and gain advantages. By their failure to be diligent workers for the Master, by leaving duties undone and words unspoken, they have allowed Satan to gain control of souls who might have been one for Christ. And that is the end of Part 7, and now for Part 8. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. 1 Samuel 15, verse 23. We can never be saved in indolence and inactivity. There is no such thing as a truly converted person living a helpless, useless life. It is not possible for us to drift into heaven. No sluggard can enter there. If we do not strive to gain an entrance into the kingdom, if we do not seek earnestly to learn what constitutes its laws, we are not fitted for a part in it. Those who refuse to cooperate with God on earth would not cooperate with him in heaven. It would not be safe to take them to heaven. There is more hope for publicans and sinners than for those who know the word of God but refuse to obey it. He who sees himself a sinner with no cloak for his sin, who knows that he is corrupting soul, body, and spirit before God, becomes alarmed lest he be eternally separated from the kingdom of heaven. He realizes his diseased condition and seeks healing from the great physician who has said, Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. John 6, verse 37 These souls the Lord can use as workers in his vineyard. The son who for a time refused obedience to his father's command was not condemned by Christ, and neither was he commended. The class who act the part of the first son in refusing obedience deserve no credit for holding this position. Their frankness is not to be regarded as a virtue. Sanctified by truth and holiness, it would make men bold witnesses for Christ, but used as it is by the sinner, it is insulting and defiant, and approaches to blasphemy. The fact that a man is not a hypocrite does not make him any the less really a sinner. When the appeals of the Holy Spirit come to the heart, our only safety lies in responding to them without delay. When the call comes, go work today in my vineyard, do not refuse the invitation. Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. 
Hebrews 4 verse 7. It is unsafe to delay obedience. You may never hear the invitation again. And let none flatter themselves that sins, cherished for a time, can easily be given up by and by. This is not so. Every sin cherished weakens the character and strengthens habit, and physical, mental, and moral depravity is the result. You may repent of the wrong you have done and set your feet in right paths, but the mold of your mind and your familiarity with evil will make it difficult for you to distinguish between right and wrong. Through the wrong habits formed, Satan will assail you again and again. And that is the end of part eight. And now for part nine. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Matthew 9, verse 37. In the command, Go work today in my vineyard, the test of sincerity is brought to every soul. Will there be deeds as well as words? Will the one called put to use all the knowledge he has, working faithfully, disinterestedly, for the owner of the vineyard? The Apostle Peter instructs us as to the plan on which we must work. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you, he says, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Second Peter 1 verses 2-7 through 7. If you cultivate faithfully the vineyard of your soul, God is making you a laborer together with himself, and you will have a work to do, not only for yourself, but for others. In representing the church as the vineyard, Christ does not teach that we are to restrict our sympathies and labors to our own numbers. The Lord's vineyard is to be enlarged. In all parts of the earth, he desires it to be extended. As we receive the instruction and grace of God, we should impart to others a knowledge of how to care for the precious plants. Thus we may extend the vineyard of the Lord. God is watching for evidence of our faith, love, and patience. He looks to see if we are using every spiritual advantage to become skillful workers in his vineyard on earth, that we may enter the paradise of God, that Eden, home from which Adam and Eve were excluded by transgression. And that is the end of part 9. And now for the final one, part 10. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15. God stands toward his people in the relation of a father, and he has a father's claim to our faithful service. Consider the life of Christ, standing at the head of humanity, serving his father. He is an example of what every son should and may be. The obedience that Christ rendered God requires from human beings today. He served his Father with love, 
in willingness and freedom. I delight to do thy will, O my God, he declared. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Psalm 40, verse 8. Christ counted no sacrifice too great, no toil too hard, in order to accomplish the work which he came to do. At the age of twelve he said, Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Luke 2, verse 49. He had heard the call and had taken up the work. My meat, he said, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. John 4, verse 34. Thus we are to serve God. He only serves who acts upon, or sorry, acts up to do the highest standard of obedience. All who would be sons and daughters of God must prove themselves co-workers with God and Christ and the heavenly angels. This is the test for every soul of those who faithfully serve him. The Lord says, they shall be mine. In that day, when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Malachi 3 verse 17 God's great object in the working out of his providences is to try men, to give them opportunity to develop character. Thus he proves whether they are obedient or disobedient to his commands. Good works do not purchase the love of God, but they reveal that we possess that love. If we surrender the will to God, we shall not work in order to earn God's love. His love as a free gift will be received into the soul, and from love to Him we shall delight to obey His commandments. There are only two classes in the world today, and only two classes will be recognized in the judgment, those who violate God's law and those who obey it. Christ gives the test by which to prove our loyalty or disloyalty. If you love me, he says, keep my commandments. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. John 14, verses 15 through 24, and 15, verse 10. And that is the end of these devotionals. I pray you all have a beautiful day in the Lord. God bless each and every one of you, and I will see you either next video or in the air. Bye-bye.